o'clock party. So if anybody's interested in that, we'd love to have you join us on Tuesday, November 11th. Okay, so without further ado, our guest speaker tonight is Mr. Jay Wilson, and he is in charge, uh, formerly with FEMA, also in charge now of a nonprofit that's in charge of disaster relief efforts worldwide. Yes. And also has a, a great interest in radio astronomy. It was kind of a spark plug here to get this effort going for radio astronomy. So, Jay, take it away. Thank you, John. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm sure glad you're here tonight. I hope you're going to have as much fun as the radio astronomy team uh, uh, has had so far getting things set up for you tonight. Like anything else with technology, things go wrong, so there's no promises, but we think it's going to work. Right, Manta? Yep. So thank you. Uh, it looks like a lot of folks, well, maybe you wouldn't. Maybe that's it. <laughs> we can do a little song, a little dance. Exactly. Well, uh, for those of you who have not visited here before, this um, is widely regarded as a premier community optical observatory. Two absolutely incredible optical instruments here in, in the domes. Uh, actually, three beautiful, beautiful instruments in two domes. And um, I hope the skies will be good so you can take a look through those, particularly in the dome to our west. Uh, this has been quite a busy summer, as Minta mentioned. The uh, telescope over there, the 18-inch, was completely refurbished. When I walked in here one day in July, you should have seen it. 10,000 little pieces down on the floor. Minta, Ken Franklin, John, two or three other people looking like they knew what they were doing, and I sure hope they did. But it's all back together, so I guess it must have worked. Well, while they were doing that, we had a group of folks working on a radio telescope system. Many of those people are here tonight, and when we get ready to inaugurate the system, I'll ask them to come up, be embarrassed by standing up here in front of you. But uh, this has been truly a team effort between the uh, board of directors of the Little Thompson Science Foundation, all the volunteers here, and um, a group of about a half a dozen folks who uh, were focused on radio astronomy. So what we're going to do tonight is, um, uh, in about 40 minutes, I hope it won't go much more than that, uh, talk about several things. I'd like to share with you a little bit about the background of radio astronomy, what it is and maybe what it's not. Um, some, the fun part of it, the whodunits, you know, the famous folks who made radio astronomy what it is, the missed opportunities, and particularly for those of you who are students, some clues as to what you might do in this field. Um, going to talk a little bit about the question that everybody asks us, and that's about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, almost everybody who's come through looking at what we've done has asked the question, are you going to be doing that? So we hope to answer that question. And then um, what I think will be the highlight of the evening is we're going to actually turn on the radio telescope for its first public appearance. And we hope the electrons are not being shy tonight. <laughs> so for those of you who are interested, everybody who's here tonight gets a first light certificate. And first light, for astronomers, is a very important thing. That's the first, um, uh, the first viewing through a new telescope. And radio telescopes, the same as optical telescopes, the first viewing is called first light, and all of you get a first light certificate if you care. Okay, let's jump into it. Now, we didn't want to make this very complicated. <laughs> Wanted to keep it as basic and as basic and as simple as possible. So uh, just as a quick reminder on, on a, a few uh, differentials here. Sir. <laughs> now, uh, we didn't want... <laughs> we didn't want to uh, insult anybody by offering you scratch paper or anything. I'm sure everybody can work this. <laughs> you know I'm kidding, right? What we're going to talk about is... Um, some of the aspects of radio astronomy that interest me personally. There are other members on the team who would have done this presentation entirely differently. And 
Uh, maybe next year when it's done again, you'll get to hear from somebody else. But this is sort of my personal view of what radio astronomy is and why it excites me and interests me. So take a look at this image, just sort of in your own mind, try to figure out what it is we're looking at. We'll explain this in a few minutes. Here's another image, just in your own mind. No, it's not what you think it is. Um, just try to come up with what you think this might be and how the picture was taken. And again, we'll come back to this in a few minutes. Now for me, let me go back to the beginning on uh, my interest in radio astronomy. Um, I was about 15 years old, really interested in electronics, telemetry, uh, radio, remote control, that sort of thing. And I put together this beautiful little gizmo here. And um, it was a radio transmitter, actually. And uh, some um, uh, sensing devices, doing all kinds of things with it. But a short time after this picture was taken, and this was what, 1961, I got my ham radio license. And people do different things with ham radio licenses. My interest was electronics, experimentation, antennas. I wanted to be an electrical engineer, essentially, and this was sort of my path to get there. I was sort of a shy individual, so I didn't talk a lot with people on the radio, but one day I was talking with a student at a university. I'd never heard of the university before. You, some of you may have heard of Cornell, but at any rate, <clears throat> Um, this was my first exposure to big time schools, by the way, uh, talking with a student who was at the ham radio club at Cornell, and he was telling me that Jupiter was sending out very unusual radio emissions, and that you could actually hear this using a ham radio. I was a little skeptical, but he said, I will stay on this frequency. Why don't you go to 20 megahertz and listen, and come back and tell me what you heard? Well, I thought I would give it a try. So this is Jupiter. This is a, a photograph taken by uh, Hubble. And so John, if you could play this audio, this is what I heard. Okay, exciting stuff, right? <laughs> That's just static, just pure static, nothing else. The only thing, it, you can shut that off. I think they've heard enough. <laughs> the only thing is, it's different kind of static sound than you would hear a few megahertz lower in the band. It was, in other words, it was different from something I had ever heard before. So static to the untrained ear, but to somebody who listens to a lot of radio, this sounded unusual. I listened to it for about 10 minutes, and the best way of describing it, it sounded like ocean waves after a while. This particular clip sounds more like you're standing under Niagara Falls. But later, it began sounding more like ocean waves. Sort of interesting. So I went back, talked to the fellow from Cornell. He told me a little bit more about it. This was a brand new phenomenon, 1961, I think this was. It had been discovered a few years before, and nobody knew exactly what was going on, but they knew that when Jupiter was visible, and it was a fair number of degrees away from the sun, so you could actually get a radio antenna pointed toward Jupiter, you would get unusual sounds sometimes, and other times you wouldn't get anything at all. So there was a great puzzlement, even in the early 1960s. Later on, maybe by the late 60s, this diagram was worked out for what Jupiter was doing. There were very, very strong uh, magnetic fields around Jupiter, and it was felt at that time that somehow these were sending radio signals toward the Earth. And by then, uh, the people who were studying this had found a different kind of signal coming from Jupiter on the same frequency, not as frequent as those ocean waves, but they sounded like this, John. Hear those popping and crackling sounds? Sort of sounds like, uh, and that's good, John, thanks. Sort of like the toaster in our house in the kitchen, right? But the University of Florida did a lot of study of that. 
And what they found was this strange image up here is a modern radiograph of the planet Jupiter. Those are emissions, actual uh, emissions coming out of the magnetic field around the planet. What's not shown here is the moon Io. And as the moon Io orbits the planet, and cuts through those magnetic lines, it is an awful lot like a car's alternator or some kind of a generator. It actually generates radio signals and sends out very, very powerful signals. When those signals are analyzed, this is what they sound like. <clears throat> So that's what got me interested. From 1961 on, I don't think there has been a month that I have not been listening to radio with an ear toward radio astronomy. And what does this mean for uh, signals coming from the sky? How can we detect them? How can we analyze them? And what does it all mean? So it's just been a personal fascination for me throughout my entire working life. So, has anybody figured out what this is? This is, to me, a good way of explaining to optical astronomers why we need to work together. Because there are some things that optical astronomers can do that we cannot do with radio astronomy. They're just better at it than we are. There are other things that radio astronomy can contribute to the knowledge of the universe, our understanding of physics, and our understanding of, of other, solar, uh, other bodies in the solar system, that it's a different approach, but it gives much more in-depth knowledge than if we had just blocked it out and said we're not going to pay attention to the radio waves. This is Venus. So on the right, is a pretty good picture taken with a pretty good telescope of the planet Venus. Um, you notice it's crescent. And why is that? The folks who, somebody back there, why would Venus have a crescent shape? Does it have, yes, somebody over here. No, because the sun's kind of facing the other side. Yeah, its orbit is inside the orbit of the Earth. So when we look at it, we can never see its full disk because it'd be exactly on the opposite side of the Earth, or the Sun from us. But with a radio telescope, and this was a composite image taken by radar from a spacecraft, radar from Earth-bound um, radio telescope dishes, and um, just combined with emissions coming from the planet itself, gave us a fairly accurate um, representation of where the mountains are, where the valleys are, and where the temperature differences are. This is something similar to a polar cap up here, which most of us would never have imagined being on such a hot planet. So that's just one example of what radio astronomy can bring to the total um, study of things in space. Now let's do a quick review of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I've got a whole bunch of things up here. We're not going to take time to go through all of them, but there's a, a few things I'd like to demonstrate out of this. It's an awful busy chart. Mainta and I worked uh, days trying to find a good one that wouldn't be too busy to share with you. But some things um, that might help you understand where radio astronomy and radio telescopes fit in would be a quick understanding of this. The electromagnetic spectrum refers to um, light, radio, and a whole bunch of other things over here. X-rays, gamma rays, um, the whole range of light, microwaves, and then radio waves. Generally, all that is measured in terms of wavelength, which is measured in meters when it's really long and down into shorter and shorter and shorter divisions, centimeters, millimeters, nanometers, just chopping up the meters so it's easier for us to measure things. Uh, that generally is the way it's uh, measured. However, 
it's possible to uh, refer to it as frequency, waves uh, per second, and that's called, uh, the, the unit of measure for that is hertz. So every once in a while we'll drop into um, a phrase we're talking about megahertz, in other words a million cycles per second would be a megahertz. And um, another way of measuring it, and those of you who are physicists in the room would probably in, uh, um, emphasize this is the way to do it, it's the energy related. And what we find is as the wavelength goes down, the frequency goes up, and so does the energy level. And that becomes extremely important for us in, uh, in studying the electromagnetic spectrum is understanding that as the frequency is going up, the energy level of every little photon or electron, the little bucket of energy that's coming in, is much, much higher. It gives us an opportunity of measuring things, but it also requires us to use different kinds of instruments. So for example, <clears throat> and this is not to scale, but this is the visible portion of light in here. The longer wavelengths of light are red. Everybody probably is familiar with that. When it gets really, really, really long, it's called infrared, and we normally think of that as heat. So when we're standing out in the midday sun, a lot of things are hitting us. We're getting heat from the sun, that's generally the infrared portion that's warming us up and making us feel pretty good. But we're also, from the sun, getting some visible light that helps us see everything around us. But we're getting quite a bit of ultraviolet. And that's why we wear sunscreen. Now, ultraviolet is sort of interesting stuff. It's kind of like light, and it's kind of like something else. You know, it's moving over into the range of x-rays when we start getting very, very short ultraviolets. And just to give you an example of what ultraviolet does, now this is just a, a simple ultraviolet uh, flashlight. What you're seeing isn't the ultraviolet, because our eyes won't let us see ultraviolet. If we were flies and moths and insects, we could probably see it pretty well. That's why insects are drawn to bug zappers is the uh, infrared light, or the ultraviolet light. That's what draws them. They can see that, and it's very attractive to them. What you're seeing here is actually purple and blue light because this isn't a perfect instrument. But what happens is, with ultraviolet, let's pick a spot like right here, or right up here. Do you see what happens when ultraviolet shines on it? What's happening there, to me, is simply fascinating the wavelength of ultraviolet light is down about the size of some of the molecules. And it's actually causing the paint or the chemical to start vibrating and giving off colors. So it looks like it is glowing. It is glowing. It's been excited by the ultraviolet light. Well, that happens with a lot of other things up in this range, too. We wouldn't call this radio astronomy up here, but it's not optical astronomy either, is it? Um, these rays don't penetrate the Earth's atmosphere very well. So we have a lot of spacecraft up there looking for gamma rays and X-rays. That's the best way to find those. Um, light gets filtered out sometimes by our atmosphere, but by and large, we've got a really good atmosphere for looking at the stars optically. But what makes radio astronomy from Earth particularly valuable is that for the most part, radio waves come through our atmosphere with very little interference. And not only that, they go through cosmic clouds. The, the stuff out there in the nebula, the, the dark material, that causes us to not be able to see beyond that dark blob with a, an optical telescope. In most cases, we can just see right through it with a radio telescope. And I have some pictures later on that I find are absolutely astounding with the things that we're able to see with a radio that we cannot see optically. Um, one last thing related to that is 
Um, let's compare what we do with a radio telescope with what we do with an optical telescope. So is everybody familiar with the basic two kinds of telescopes? You have one that's got mirrors and the other one has lenses. And there are combinations of those, but those are essentially the two different kinds. Well, we do the same thing with radio telescopes. This would be, this dish would be like a mirror, right? The radio waves come in here, they get bounced up to a sensor. It would be like our eyepiece in a, uh, a mirrored telescope. This is a radio antenna that does exactly the same thing to radio signals that an optical telescope's um, lenses do to light. It refracts and then allows the signal to be concentrated and sent on to our electronics so we can decode the signals. Well, that's probably more about the electromagnetic spectrum than anybody here except some of the hams would be interested in knowing. But now that you know that, let's see what some of our, the pioneers in this field have done with the, this knowledge. And that was about the amount of knowledge that many of these people had when they went into the field. Um, we could go back in the 1800s and talk about how radio waves were first discovered. But let's start with this guy because he's absolutely fascinating. His name is Carl Jansky. He worked for Bell Labs in New Jersey um, this picture was taken later in life. Notice he's standing outside a mafia car here, so that fits with New Jersey, right? <clears throat> but um, this was taken a few years later. But he was a young engineer, um, recently out of college, uh, hired by Bell Labs to do lots of engineering kind of stuff. Well, Bell Labs had a very successful, not Bell Labs, Bell Telephone had a very successful program of having phone calls from New York to London. Started in about 1927, worked beautifully. By 1929, the system that had been working beautifully suddenly started having a lot of interference that they hadn't had before. Every week it seemed to get worse. And by year's end, the company was losing a lot of money. You know what they charged for a three-minute phone call from New York to London in those days? Three-minute phone call. You had to wait, generally, six hours to get your call put through. You had to go through an operator. Six hours if you were lucky. And you got that three minutes for $75. And $75 was worth quite a bit of money in 1927 and 28. This was a fortune. So. I hope our modern cell phone companies don't find out about that. <laughs> but at any rate, um, Bell Labs went through several engineers working on this project and nobody could come up with any answers. The equipment seemed to be working fine. It was exactly the same stuff they'd been using for two or three years. Something was wrong. So they turned to the new guy in the, the, the office. And uh, Ken Franklin here used to work for Bell Labs, so he can probably verify this. You give the failure job to the new guy, right, Ken? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the senior engineers are not going to risk their position on this because we're not going to come up with an answer. Well, this guy, who uh, he was a, a smart engineer, but he had no particular background in radio or communications. So he was starting from scratch, knowing the day he took over, he probably knew just about what you now know about the electromagnetic spectrum. Because he was an electrical engineer, not necessarily, I'm not even sure they had invented electronic engineering at the time. What he did was interesting. He took the wheels off of a Ford Model A. He built this contraption that to me looks like a wrecked Wright Flyer airplane. But uh, in essence, it's nothing but two by four boards holding up copper water pipe. And the copper water pipe formed a directional antenna. And he was able to spin it around on a track using those wheels. Make a very, very long story short, three years later, he's still working on this project. He thinks he knows the answer, but being a careful engineer, He's not going to tell the boss, 
something and then later to be proved wrong. He wants to be absolutely sure that he's got it right. So in his mind, it's going to take a year or two to prove his theory. What he ended up doing, he is the first recorded person that we know of to annotate in a journal that he had received galactic noise. In other words, noise from the galaxy. What he found, and the reason it took him so long to document it, was in the mornings, at a certain time, in the, early in the summer, New York could not hear London. Later in the evening, London couldn't hear New York. And the reason for that, with his radio direction finding here, can be found on our star wall just about back here. The constellation Sagittarius was emitting monstrously powerful radio signals. Very, very powerful radio signals. So he documented it after about three years, got published in some uh, electronic Engi or electrical engineer publications, and um, Bell Labs completely dropped the project. They assigned him to other things. He, for the rest of his life, he never got back to working with radio. He simply worked on other things for Bell Labs for the rest of his working career. As near as we know, not one astronomer, not one physicist in the world read his reports. Nobody different professions, different languages. Because remember a minute ago I was talking in terms of millions of electron volts on antennas? Well, that was the language of the physicist. He was talking in terms of other things, signal to noise ratios, all kinds of things. Well, at any rate, his papers did get circulated around and this fellow, a few years later, read one of them and said, wow, what an amazing discovery Mr. Jansky has made. Now, Grote Reber, the gentleman's name, and you notice we've got a strange thing here. He was a radio ham. Do we have any amateur radio operators in the room, by the way? Anybody? we got a few. Okay, you guys will understand this. Grote was interested as an amateur astronomer. Um, what he did was go back through Jansky's papers, uh, try to figure out the radio frequencies Jansky had been using, and this was, what, five years, four years, six years afterwards. He said, I'm going to build the most efficient receiving antenna possible to receive those signals from space. This is what he built in his backyard. Now, my wife accuses me of building things like this in the backyard too, okay? <laughs> But he actually built this. This is a monstrous thing. Um, huge, took up a, a big, big backyard in the uh, outskirts of Chicago. Um, and with this, he started doing sky surveys. And in a few minutes, we'll, I'll show you a picture of one of his sky surveys. In 1939, how many radio astronomers do you think there were in the entire world? One. Grote Reber. Nobody else. Grote had a very hard time getting his papers published in either astronomy or physics uh, journals. Simply because nobody understood what he was doing and how it related to their professions. However, he did get um, one of the, one of the uh, physics journals just went out on a limb. Uh, it was peer-reviewed. Those of you who do peer-reviewing know what this means. Peer-reviewed, all the reviewers said, I can't make sense of it, don't publish it. But the editor had a, an intuition that this is something that needed to be shared. So he published it. There were about 250 copies of the publication worldwide. Some went to libraries. Some probably never were read. But one copy went to a university in the Netherlands. And it was read by a fellow who's rather famous in astronomy circles, John uh, Oort, of the Oort Cloud fame. Um, he read the paper, was sort of intrigued by it, 
talked it over with one of his grad students. This picture was taken much later in life. This was a young grad student at the time. And they just started contemplating this when what happened in the 1940s in Europe? Yeah, World War II occurred. Uh, the Netherlands had it pretty rough. And um, the university um, came under some rather uh, difficult times with the invading army. So Dr. Ort and his graduate students fled to the countryside, resigned their positions at the university, went to the countryside and became farmers, way, way, way out in the sticks as farmers during the day, but physicists at night. And um, they dealt with a lot of astrophysics kind of questions. <coughs> But they didn't have telescopes, they didn't have radios, but what they did have was brilliant minds and inquisitive natures. And this fellow came up with a theoretical explanation for how we can detect hydrogen throughout the universe back to the moment of, they didn't even call it the Big Bang at the time, that's what we would call it now, back billions of years to the beginning of the universe. He developed this mathematically, but there was no way at all to test it because they had no equipment, no laboratories or anything else. As soon as uh, the uh, World War II was over, they went to work on the question and lo and behold, the formulas proved to be precisely correct, down to I think 12 decimal points. Um, had been worked out under the worst imaginable conditions by people who, who had good thoughts and enough understanding of the basics in theory that they could expand on it. So uh, a lot of people now are getting involved in radio astronomy right after World War II. On the order of, of a few hundred radio astronomers now. So we went from one in 1939 to possibly two or three, if you include uh, uh, Dr. Ort uh, and his students in the mid-40s, to now a few hundred in the 1950s. Um, this fellow, John Krauss, again, a ham radio operator, um, and uh, the hams know this guy very well because he was one of the leading experts on antenna design. He wrote the textbook on an antenna design. Um, while he was building this thing in Columbus, Ohio, or just north of Columbus, Ohio, in Europe, there were similar construction projects. So I'm glossing over a whole bunch of things that would be important to, to folks who are looking at the total history, but just focusing on this because it is kind of interesting. He built this thing, which was about three football fields in size, and uh, dedicated it. Um, uh, the work began in 55. It took almost 20 years to get this thing totally built. In the meantime, they had interim operational capabilities. But one of the things they ended up doing with this was one of the first consistent sky surveys to try to do good mapping of the galaxy. And then, while they're doing that in their spare time, let's start looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. This was, at the time, one of the most capable radio astronomy facilities in the entire world. It was steerable. It doesn't look like it was. But they could move um, this reflector over here and move this horn and actually steer the beam around the sky. I told you Krauss was pretty good with antennas. Um, interesting thing here, and the reason we're taking some time on this, this facility was built by Ohio State University where John Krauss worked. Um, it was not on their property, however. It was on the property owned by Ohio Wesleyan University who had a good physics department, and the deal was We'll give you the land, you build it, and then we'll have joint classes. Well, somehow or another, the people in the facilities department at Ohio Wesleyan decided to sell this land because the university needed some money and a builder wanted to put in a golf course. <laughs> One day, the radio astronomers were at work and the signals stopped coming in. 
When they went outside their building, this is what they saw. The builders had arrived, and they, in the course of a week, destroyed uh, one of the most valuable radio telescopes ever built. Uh, all that's left now at the site is just a uh, plaque, a roadside plaque, saying this is where it used to be. Another interesting thing, this uh, lady, Jocelyn Bell, discovered what we now call pulsars. These are pulsating stars. They sound like a clicking talk, uh, a clock ticking. It's an interesting sound if you listen to it. Um, she had a hard time discovering it. She heard them. She saw the, the traces on chart paper. But she had a hard time convincing anybody uh, that what she was receiving was really something from the sky. Her faculty advisor, a Dr. Hewitt, told her to stop wasting her time on it. That's just interference. It's a streetcar. It's uh, some industrial process going on. She refused to do that. She kept spending her time on it. She couldn't sleep because these noises just kept coming back. It finally occurred to her maybe another grad student is playing a trick on me and Dr. Hewitt is in on it. And, um, but I, she was so certain that she had found something, she continued pressing, she wrote a good paper on it, which um, Dr. Hewitt ended up uh, editing and submitting and he won the Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of pulsars. Um, she was not mentioned, by the way, in that uh, Nobel Prize. Her name didn't show up anywhere. Um, uh, Dr. Hewitt uh, later claimed that he did include her reference as a footnote in his paper. But at any rate, there was such outrage in the European academic community that this lady has received about every major award in science with the exception of the Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, the Queen made her commander of the British Empire, uh, which means she goes with the title of Dame. Uh, and um, this is a recent picture of her at an astronomy conference. Um, she loves to speak. She has never once, never once in public, said anything bad about Dr. Hewitt. On the contrary, a different approach. And uh, David uh, Joffe and I met uh, Joe Taylor uh, just a few months ago. Joe Taylor, notice a ham call sign up here, K1JT. Uh, he, uh, at the Arecibo uh, radio telescope in Puerto Rico, he and a graduate assistant, Hulse, discovered binary pulsars. They were actually just looking for ordinary pulsars. They wanted to map a few more of them. But they kept hearing things that didn't make sense. And based on what they knew, this was really strange. So they kept persisting and persisting and persisting. When uh, Dr. Taylor was nominated for his Nobel Prize, what did he say? There needs to be two medals. One for me, one for my assistant because we work together on this. <clears throat> so Joe let um, David and me hold his Nobel Prize medal. Now I'd never seen one before. I'd seen pictures of them. This is one pound of 18 karat gold, one pound that is then plated with 24 karat gold. He did check our pockets, by the way. <laughs> Now, Joe does a lot of things for the field. He was going to try to be here tonight, but there's a famous um, uh, radio astronomy facility in Europe that was decommissioned and almost torn down about five years ago. Um, some private uh, uh, money became available, and it is being recommissioned this very weekend in Europe as a private foundation, very similar to what we're doing here. Joe has given us a tremendous amount of encouragement for what we're doing here tonight. So, just a quick walkthrough of what you might expect to see in radio astronomy facilities. This is a great big telescope. Um, this is a, um, it's one of the largest steerable dishes in the world. It's in Green Bank, uh, West Virginia at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, or NRAO. And I think Terry uh, Bullitt back there is wearing an NRAO shirt. And, um, yeah, been there, got the shirt. 
beautiful place, wonderful um, visitor center. If you're ever in West Virginia and want to really, really go to the Outback, this is a place to go. Um, radio uh, telescope antennas can look like this. This is one that uh, John Krauss built. So they don't have to be big and fancy. They can be something as simple as that. They don't even have to be th that fancy. They can look like this. And this is a good research instrument for certain things. Um, just as this one is over in the corner. We do a lot with these very, very simple things. So for those of you who might be interested in doing something at home, this may be something you can do. Now, I think everybody in this room over the age of, what would you guess, 30? has heard signals from space using another kind of ra radio astronomy antenna. This thing here, which we called what? <laughs> Rabbit ears. Okay, let's see what this sounds like. Is that the way you remember it? Well, what's going on here is the snow on the picture itself and kids, your parents and grandparents can explain that. The snow up here is actually the visual representation of what we're hearing. Okay? And that's similar to the process we're going to be using in a few minutes with our own radio telescope here. Um, a high percentage of what you see on this screen and what you heard over here is actually coming from outer space. Some of it is industrial noise, some of it's a toaster in the kitchen, some of it's the lights here, but a lot of it is coming in from the antenna, and it's exactly what Jansky heard. It's exactly what Groot Reber heard. It's exactly what Joe Taylor heard. These are signals coming from space, and we're not aware of them because we have no body organ that lets us uh, receive radio signals. Now, other animals, you know, I mentioned a minute ago, there are some, uh, some uh, moths and flies that can see infrared. Well, there are some creatures, uh, I said that wrong, that can see ultraviolet. There are some creatures that can see infrared. Uh, pit vipers, or snakes like um, copperheads and uh, rattlesnakes, the ones that are called pit vipers. The pit underneath their eyes, it gives them the name, is actually an organ that receives temperature readings from the surroundings. So they can see mice and rodents, they can see their prey. Wouldn't it be something if we had the ability, an organ, that would allow us to see radio waves? And it's conceivable that a, a creature might do that. We, you know, there may be creatures out there that do it. We just don't know. We don't know what to look for. But what we do know is that we can use instruments like the television, like this, like these things, to help us receive the signal and translate it into something meaningful to us that we can do something with. Whoa. And I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay, so when, um, when radio astronomy first got started, this is the output we would get from our system. A chart recording, just a piece of paper with some scratches on it. And someone would have to say, boy, you know, something might have happened here, something might have happened here, now what was it? Well, as we got a little bit more sophisticated, and it required a whole lot of time, and this was generally done by the graduate students, um, people started drawing things. So this, this blip here might have ha ended up being this. It wasn't. These are two different things. But, you know, it might leave. What am I doing? <laughs> um, small buttons, big fingers. That's the answer. This is actually the drawings that Grote Reber, remember the guy who, with the big dish in the backyard, like Kathy says I have? Um, he actually drew this by hand based on uh, his charts that looked something like this. So it required some translation. Now some things that Grote did is he used surveyors uh, numbers for finding things. Because he wasn't an astronomer yet, he later on became a great astronomer. But he's using, uh, like straight up is zero degrees. Uh, he didn't live on the equator so that's 
you know, that's not the way an astronomer would measure things, but it's useful. It can be translated. Um, so this was sort of the way it was done in the 1950s. By the late 1960s, we had a little better computers, and they were able to help us draw things. So this was a sky survey done in the late 1960s. And you can see we're getting a whole lot more detail because we got more people looking, uh, more data, but then a better data processing capability. A little bit later on, and this would have been from the late 70s, now we've got the personal computer. And the personal computer can really add a lot, right? So now it's able to give us brightness, different colors, show different things on one chart. But then things continue to improve. This is what it's like today. And for those of you who may have seen this image before, um, this is a nebula. And you can tell from these stars that this is a composite of a, an optical photograph and a radiograph of things within the nebula in more detail than can be seen by anybody's optical telescope. This is a famous radio source in the sky seen just with radio waves. Uh, this is called Cassiopeia A, so it's kind of up in the north. It's in the constellation Cassiopeia, and it's the brightest radio source there, and that's how it gets its name. But um, the, the um, radio astronomer who made this graph programmed the computer to show the brightest uh, radio signals as light colors, the weaker ones as dark colors. They could have done it exactly the opposite, but that's the way they decided to do it. And then when combined with optical photography, this is what we come up with. So visually, it's stunning, or at least I think it is. It's beautiful. It's beautiful artwork, yes. but it also tells us a lot. It gives you a chance to study this, and so if you have the legend, a way of decoding this, you would be able to tell what radio frequency this represented, what brightness this represented, how much power was represented up here, and what this was, whether this was infrared or x-ray. So those are just some of the things that can be done. But now, let's talk a little bit about the search for extraterrestrials. <laughs> and uh, for those of you uh, in the back, maybe you can't read, the basis of this is nobody's contacting us because they're smart enough not to. Uh, this is the fellow who's pretty much credited with starting the modern movement, and I'll call it SETI, which stands for Search for Extra terrestrial intelligence. His name is Frank Drake, a very well-respected scientist, a, uh, a radio astronomer who has worked at all the leading uh, institutions in the country. He was the director of the world's largest uh, radio telescope for some time. But from early on, um, he's held the position that there is a great probability that somewhere in the Milky Way galaxy, there is another intelligent civilization and there's also a great probability that they are trying to send messages to the rest of the galaxy. Again, his opinion. He came up with this formula, um, and it's not as intimidating as you would think. It's a conceptual formula. Uh, there's no attempt to sit down and try to do this mathematically here tonight, but basically uh, what he's saying out of this is there are a whole lot of factors, these may not be all of them, but there's a whole lot of factors that lead to whether or not a civilization might want to communicate. And these are some of the things down here that go into the numbers of uh, civilizations out there that are right now trying to communicate. To cut to the bottom on all this, when this uh, Drake equation first came out, um, the original guess was is that the, the total number of civilizations, this NT over here, total number of civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy now trying to communicate is somewhere between a thousand and a million. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine, but somebody worked these numbers through, and that's what they came up with, between a thousand and a million. But you know, small differences in your assumptions make a huge difference in how this number is turning out, right? Like, um, the, 
let's take a look at this. The mean rate at which suitable stars are born, 1 to 10 a year. Well, it's, that makes a difference between 1 and 10 in your final number because you're multiplying all these things. But what if it's only 1 every 100 years? Or what if it's 10,000 a year? Well, at any rate, the current guess on this is, guess what? The numbers have, <laughs> have really become strange. Uh, at the latest SETI conference, there was a group arguing that this total number is now two. Not a thousand, two. That there are two civilizations, us and somebody else. Another group of people who said, oh no, we've run the numbers, it's a hundred million. <laughs> so it's somewhere between two and a hundred million. Take your pick. <laughs> now remember back on the big ear, that, that big football, three football? Yes, sir. Jay, when it comes to the Drake equation, I might point out that 15 years ago, the number of stars that supported planets was effectively zero. Yeah, In 15 true. years, that number has gone, it's, it's, I think, approaching 1,000. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that is true. And, and that changes those numbers dramatically. Um, remember back at the big ear, that three football field size thing in Ohio. Um, in 1977, uh, one of the, the lead professors was actually doing the analysis on the printouts. He came across this printout that indicated that there was a very, very unusual signal being received during one of the times when they were looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. Now, the people on the other end weren't supposedly sending 6, E, Q, J, 5. Those are just computer representations for the strength and duration of the signal, and they were just computer codes. It was so dramatic that the professor wrote the word wow on the side of the paper, and this has become a rather famous piece of paper now called what? The wow document. Um, it was, has, they have spent thousands, probably tens of thousands of hours with the major radio telescopes in the world looking in this precise location. The signal has never been repeated and nobody knows. There are people who will uh, go to their end believing that this was a signal to us from some extraterrestrial intelligence other people who are saying, no, it was just an airplane flying over. <laughs> I don't know. Now, uh, for those who are seriously interested in working in the field of SETI, there's a couple of things you can do if this interests you. The SETI at home program has been around for quite a few years. Essentially, it's a screensaver, but it uses the computing power of your computer when you're not using it to run through some analysis of radio signals that are being received at the radio telescope in Puerto Rico at Arecibo. And this is kind of the pretty uh, printout that you see on your screen. And what you're, of course, looking for is to either confirm something like this or prove that nothing like that ever exists again. Um, we do have a handout back there that shows you how you can get a hold of SETI at home, but you can just Google that and you can find it. Uh, this is what the group is now doing. Uh, they have a whole bunch of telescopes in the desert in California, funded by um, one of the founders of Microsoft. And this entire valley of telescopes is dedicated to the search for extraterrestrial communications. At the same time, this initiative, the Communicate initiative, is using the huge telescope, or has used the huge telescope in Arecibo to actually transmit messages in the direction of the place where the wow signal supposedly came from. Now we can spend the rest of the night arguing about whether it's wise to go shouting out into the night, I'm here, but it has been done. Whether our signals will ever be heard or not is another question. But that's what has happened. Okay, now, I know this has been fast and furious, but we're getting to the fun part, I think. This is what we are um, attempting to do here at Little Thompson. We're taking into account some basics on radio astronomy that uh, radio emissions are just like photons, or, or photons are just like light, only different. Okay? We can deal with them the same way, we can analyze them the same way, but they're in the same laws of physics apply. 
But there are some limitations. A radio telescope, no matter how fancy it is, remember those huge, huge, huge things, those big dishes. It's just a one pixel camera. Now, who here owns a one pixel camera? Any, anybody? Okay, it's a one pixel camera, but here's the difference. It can take thousands or tens of thousands of snapshots a second. In fact, the one we have running that you'll be seeing in a few minutes is running about 44,100 snapshots per second. But it's one pixel at a time. Uh, direct and reflected signals are both useful. And the telescope you'll be seeing is depending on reflected signals, similar to radar. And a radio telescope can detect a lot of things. Thermal emissions, which comes from something that's hot. Non-thermal, which is a generated signal, like coming from a generator, like was happening with uh, Jupiter. Um, and it can be natural emissions or artificial, whether from human beings, extraterrestrial, um, intentional or not. Here are some advantages and disadvantages. On the whole, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages, but when we're planning the system, we have to take into account some of these things. Large antennas are frequently needed, and that is usually one of the big challenges to deal with. But here at LTO, these are some of the things that we're trying to do. We want to investigate the sun and, and the ionospheric effects of storms on the sun. Uh, want to look at Jupiter, investigate uh, some deep space objects, galactic sources. But, but more than anything else, we want to run this as an educational outreach. We want to teach radio astronomy basics and astronomy basics to students, students of all ages, and inspire, inspire students to explore sciences to the extent that they possibly can. Whether they work in the field of science or just have it as a hobby like I do, um, we think a huge contribution can be made to society. And then we want this place to be a laboratory for independent <laughs> studies. Remember most of the questions asked by those people who became famous astronomers simply came from, I don't understand this. What can I do to understand more about it? What experiments can I create? We want to help students do that and ask those questions. This is what we're doing. Right now, we, we're set up, and tonight, you'll help us inaugurate meteor detection. Uh, beginning tomorrow, we're going to start on a high-frequency sky survey, mapping the sky. And we have already begun. Scott Kent from Berthoud High School and I just yesterday finished a program uh, to become certified in uh, running a program called Skynet Juniors where we can give our students access to a world-class radio telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia. It's a 20 meter dish and they will be able to use it from the high school and from here to uh, do radio astronomy searches of the sky. Next year we're going to do a whole lot more and one of the big things is to link with our good friends with the Estes Park Memorial Observatory who have a radio astronomy project there. We will be linking our two systems so that we can take advantage of the baseline between our locations and get much, much more fine, um, clear viewing of the sky. And it all starts tonight. So this is what our students will be using back at uh, Green Bank. It's exactly what it looks like. It's a solid dish, 20 meters across, um, which is you know, almost 70 feet. Uh, last night, if this was one I took last night, this is a, an image I took last night of the Crab Nebula, or M1, using this dish just to show you the kinds of things we can do. Uh, it's kind of a pretty picture, but uh, it contains so much data about the Crab Nebula that we probably could spend two or three hours going through a data analysis on this and learn something about the Crab Nebula that I don't currently know. Maybe somebody else does know, but I don't. And this will give our students an opportunity to do self-exploration. This is sort of what went into building our radio telescope. You're not going to see the radio equipment here because Later tonight, where you're looking at the telescopes, you can just go around the corner in the back room here and see it. But everything here at the observatory was done with volunteer labor, from building of the domes to the building of the building itself, to putting up the radio antennas, the building of the radio antenna itself. 
um, running all the cabling. Everything was done with volunteer labor and it will continue to be that way. <clears throat> so I think we're at the time for first light. If I could ask Sven to come forward and help us with this. And remember everybody, get your certificates when you leave. I think we have enough. If not, give us your name and number and we'll get you some. Okay, we're going to do this in the proper way, aren't we Sven? Okay, so Sven, could you tell them a little bit about who you are? And Yeah, he's going to be one of our leaders, I think, in this program very, very shortly. Okay, Sven, let's get started. So I'm going to run the checklist and you do the items, okay? Master power on. Computer power on. VNC connection on. And if we could get the VNC at the back. Let's wait and see if that works, because that will be pretty critical. Okay, it looks like it's working to this point. Okay, switch number three on. Why? It's on the checklist. I don't think switch number three actually came on, did it? I guess it did. Oh well, that didn't work. So we'll turn switch number three off. Okay. It's scary, that one. Yeah. Audio monitor on. Okay, and now the big part is antenna switch to position four. Okay, what we are seeing is a type of radar. There's a radio transmitter about 750,000 miles south from here. There's actually several, and you're seeing the signals from them here. As meteors go over, meteors leave a trail that normally glows if it's a large meteor, right? And we see it as a shooting star. These meteors uh, leave a trail that will reflect radio signals. And here might be a good example of one. Here's another one. So we're actually picking up reflections from meteors. And when it's a really strong signal, we can hear it as a ping. Now these haven't been really strong yet because the meteors know we're watching. <laughs> but this is a very useful experiment uh, for tracking meteors, for determining um, when meteor showers occur, and for, here's a stronger one, and I heard a little ping up here. Uh, and for determining, um, once we have a few monitoring stations hooked together, the direction and uh, relative size of the meteors. Yeah, you did? Okay. Now, um, the, the projects we have running, this project is going to be under the uh, directorship of uh, David Eckhart. And David, could you stand so people can see who you are? Uh, David um, is going to be our, our team leader for that. And our, our other project, which will get started running tomorrow, which will be the Sky Survey, will be under the direction of Terry Bullitt in the back. So if you can wave to everybody back there, Terry. <clears throat> and the room is kind of crowded, but um, if we could just real quickly end by having everybody who's worked on this project, who's made contributions, just stand where you are and wave at the crowd. I'd like to say thank you to all of you. Um, <laughs> Lots and lots and lots, including Sven. For, 
for those who are interested, we got a whole bunch of show and tell stuff up here. I'll stay over here and answer any questions about this. If uh, David and Terry will go to the back room and answer questions about the equipment back there. And for those who might really be interested in what a meteor looks like, this is a meteorite. It's up here too. This is a rock that used to be a meteor. Once it hits the ground, we call them meteorites. This one came from North Africa and it's called a stony meteorite because it's stone. <laughs> The other kind is a metallic, but this one is stony. And it's these things up here that are resulting from this. Any questions or anything before I turn it back over to Mainta? Where is, where is the radio telescope? Good question. <laughs> as you came in the front door, um, you probably did not see, but as you're leaving on the left, on our fence line, is an antenna. That's the antenna portion. Um, that's for the sky survey. On that end of the building, the east side of the building, we have a small antenna, and that's what's receiving these signals. The radio equipment and the computer that's doing the signal processing is immediately behind this wall, and you're welcome to see that. Um, David and Terry can answer questions about it. Yes? To get the obvious Sheldon question out of the way, Shouldn't the certificate be for first RF, not first light? First noise. Yeah, first noise. First noise. <laughs> Typically, even radio astronomers call it first light because photons are photons. But it could be first RF. You can change yours. <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you all for your time and attention, and have fun tonight. Thank you. And thank you, thank you, Sven.